So hello everyone. Uh, this is the advanced section uh, by Eric and talking about information geometry. And maybe Eric, you can first briefly introduce yourself and, and start uh, the section. Yeah, it's your stage now. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you, Chuning. Um, so my name is Eric Galinkin. I am an artificial intelligence researcher at Rapid7. I'm also a PhD candidate in computer science at Drexel University, uh, working on the intersection of information security and decision theory. Uh, so one of the things that I got really excited about uh, a couple of years ago and have just not been able to stop talking about is information geometry. And so that's uh, that's what I'm gonna cover today. So uh, yeah, that's that's me, that's what we're talking about, great. And, uh, oh no, did I make, there we go, perfect. Okay, so what is information geometry, right? Let's just get that uh, out of the way off the bat. Information geometry, and this is from Shunichi Amari, who is kind of the father of the, the field, uh, one of the fathers of the field, is a method of exploring the world of information by means of modern geometry, right? And when we say modern geometry, that is kind of a, a deliberately weaselly term, right? It means algebraic geometry, differential geometry. It means, you know, anything that we would consider beyond kind of classical Euclidean geometry, right? So these are your studies of manifolds more than they are the studies of, say, triangles, right? Uh, so we study information geometry because using a geometric foundation uh, instead of a conventional measure theoretic, and there is measure theory in here, uh, but you know, measure theoretic probability, we use this geometric uh, formalization that lets us generalize and extend existing results, right? So we can use geometric tools instead of analytic or algebraic tools uh, to try and tackle these problems, right? And I provide uh, towards the end one of my favorite uh, geometric simplifications of a, of a very famous result. So, right, the basic idea is that we're dealing with a space of models, right? So we have like our, our, you know, our Euclidean plane, right? Like our flat plane, and each point on that plane is a model. Uh, and so we want to use a notion of distance, a geometric notion of distance, so that we can say how far away what we think the model might be, right? Our current best guess is from what the data is telling us, right? So in statistical inference, we have a space of probability distributions, and then we try to infer what distribution the data was sampled from using these geometric tools. And we'll get a little bit more specific about what that means uh, in a couple of slides. So first, I'm just going to introduce some terminology. If the terminology isn't super, super, super clear to you, uh, feel free to ask questions, unmute. Um, and if it's not super necessary or relevant, then great. Uh, if it is, right, we'll, we'll try and dig into it. I think I cover charts and atlases, and that's not super important. Uh, but a manifold is important, right? And a manifold is basically any flat space, right? If you zoom in closely enough, it looks kind of like Rn, right? It looks, looks like the normal Euclidean space. So we can think of curves in like two dimensions, right? You have like your, uh, you know, your parabolas, your hyperbolas, whatever. Um, and in three dimensions, you can have, you know, balls, you can have uh, cones, you can have whatever, right? Cubes. Uh, but you can also have these really, really, really high dimensional figures. And of course, what we all do, and some famous mathematician said this, but I forget exactly who, is um, we all just think of three-dimensional shapes and then uh, close our eyes and say the dimension that we're really thinking of, uh, right? So you just think of like a sphere in, in uh, three dimensions uh, and you just close your eyes and you go, yeah, it's 40 dimensions. And, and that's good enough. So some examples of manifolds that you may be familiar with uh, are, right? Just the real line is, that's a manifold. Uh, S1 
is just the circle, the unit circle. That is a manifold as well. Uh, you have manifolds of dimension two. So those are your surfaces, your Cartesian plane, which I like to illustrate with a piece of paper uh, or a sphere, right? That is your, your uh, empty sphere, your S2. And of course you can have higher dimensional hypersurfaces and hyperplanes and whatever, right? And a lot of these are really exciting objects. Uh, they're really exciting objects for a lot of reasons. My personal motivation tends to be in statistical learning, right? So uh, the next piece of terminology I want to define is a metric, right? A metric is a, a distance. It tells you how far away two elements in a given set are. So the formal definition is that, right, D is a function defined on uh, X cross X uh, onto, you know, zero to infinity, right? Where it's kind of open on the infinity side and it's inclusive with zero. And the distance between X and Y is zero if X and Y are the same. So you have that identity. The distance of X and Y is equal to the distance of Y and X. So it's symmetric. Uh, this is going to become an important distinguishing feature in a moment about metrics. And it satisfies the triangle inequality, right? Which is that it, the distance between X and Y is equal, is less than or equal to the distance between X and a third point Z plus the distance between that third point Z and Y, right? And so uh, every metric induces a topology on a set. And so you have your set, right? Whatever set you want it to be. And if you uh, have a metric on that set, you induce a topology. So what is a topology? A topology basically tells you uh, that things can be close together. That, that's really kind of abstractly what it is. Uh, they may not be metrizable, right? So there exist topologies that do not have a metric, but if you put a metric on a set, you have a way to say, these things are close together and these things are far apart, right? That's really all a topology is in the abstract sense. And there are loads and loads and loads of different topologies. Um, the Zariski topology is one that people get really excited about, especially algebraic geometers. Uh, we don't care about any of those. We can just care about standard metric topologies uh, for the purpose of this, this talk, right? And so if we want to make our definition of a manifold topologically formal, we say that a manifold M is a topological surface such that for all points X on M, there is a neighborhood U of X and some integer N such that U is homeomorphic, which is topologically equivalent to a subset of Rn, right? Which just means that every point has some space around it that is flat, right? So if N is two, right? We have a, a nice manifold uh, and N is two, that means that every point has a space around it that is R2, right? It's the, the XY plane, which is a super nice property to have. Uh, we really, really like this property because it lets us do a lot of, of really cool things. It lets us, um, you know, simplify this notion of distance. It lets us simplify dynamics and movement on these manifolds. And uh, I do want to make a note that there are lots of definitions that are more technical. If anybody here is a physicist or an algebraic geometer and I didn't use your favorite definition of a manifold, I'm really sorry. Uh, and those are useful in their respective fields. In information geometry, we can ignore most of that because we just want to imagine that points that are close together are on a flat plane or a flat hyperplane, right? So uh, there is this notion in, um, in manifolds of charts and atlases, right? So you have a manifold M and a chart is just an open subset of M with an open embedding uh, phi that maps that subset onto Rn. So this is your um, ability to put, uh, oh, I'm gonna get to that. Yeah, does the restriction to be locally flat have to do with the notion of continuity? Uh, it can, and it's crucially related to differentiability. And that's actually on this slide. Um, and that's what we that's what we need. So right, this is just that um, chart on a on a manifold, right? Being that neighborhood around a given point that we mentioned, 
that is, uh, it, it can map onto Rn, right? So again, R, you know, R1 being the real line, R2 being your Cartesian plane, et cetera, right? So there's a neighborhood, you can map it onto Rn, perfect. And then an atlas is this collection of the charts that covers the manifold. So you can have your manifold and it can be really, really ugly and awful and twisted and, and, and just terrible. Uh, but as long as it has a chart, which tells you if you're close to this point, you can map it onto Rn in this way. And then you have an atlas and that's just the set of all of those charts. Uh, and so if you take the union of all of those charts, uh, then you have exactly your manifold M, right? Which is, which is really cool, because that means you have a coordinate system on your manifold, no matter how ugly it is. Uh, and so if all of the charts, if all of those maps, right, from the neighborhood onto Rn are differentiable, then we say that the manifold is differentiable. And that lets us get a really good notion of continuity. It lets us compute gradients. Uh, and computing gradients is uh, really, really, really important for a number of applications in statistical learning and in physics. So there's one more notion I want to cover, just a little bit of terminology, and then we'll, we'll keep going. And this is the notion of the geodesic, right? So on a plane, right, if you take a, a you know, flat plane, if you take a piece of paper, the shortest distance between any two points is a straight line, right? Uh, this is something we all know. It's, you know, going at an angle, the, the L2 distance being shorter than the Manhattan distance, right? Like, these are, these are familiar notions to a lot of us. Uh, so this begets the question, what is a straight line on a curved surface, right? If you have a, a ball, right? You have like a, a, a hockey ball or, you know, yeah, a baseball, perfect, um, right? How do you put a straight line on a curved surface, right? So we generalize this notion and we call it a geodesic. And the geodesic is just the, yes, exactly like Schild's ladder. Um, the geodesic is just the shortest point, right? It's the generalization. So there's this affine connection, right? And an affine connection is an object that connects tangent spaces together, right? So again, think of your ball and you have like a, like a rigid piece of cardboard uh, and you can move it around the ball. And if there was a way to connect two rigid pieces of cardboard with say a piece of string, that would be your affine connection, right? Those pieces of cardboard are touching the ball at exactly one point. So they're tangent to the point where it's touching. This one's tangent to the point where it's touching and they're connected together. Um, it would be a lot better if we were in a classroom and I have props. So apologies for that. Um, and so then we use this notion of parallel transport. Right. And parallel transport is if we have this tangent vector, right? So take your tangent plane, and just squish it down to just be a vector, right? Uh, that touches the ball at one point and keeps going off to infinity each way. If you move the tangent vector along your surface or along the curve, uh, such that at each point, the tangent vector remains parallel to the previous tangent vectors, right? Uh, then the geodesic is the straight line that gets induced by moving it along that path. So that is, that is how we uh, find the geodesic for a manifold. And really the key thing to take away here is, um, the geodesic is just the straight line on a curved manifold, on a Riemannian manifold, right? Uh, which are most of the manifolds that we're interested in information geometry. And there is a way to find it by uh, taking this geodesic. And if you have a background in physics, uh, what is it? Foucault's pendulum also uh, gives you good intuition for uh, parallel transport. 
I am not a physicist and I don't know anything about physics. Uh, so, you know, generalize if you will. Uh, if the, um, what is it? Wikipedia article on Foucault's pendulum is actually really, really good and uh, gives good intuition for, for how that works in physics. So we talked about metrics, right? And now I wanna talk about divergences. So in when we're talking about probability distributions and when we're talking about information, uh, we're often not able to use a metric, right? We need to look at divergences. And so a divergence is just a statistical distance, right? It's how far away one probability distribution is from another. Um, so metrics are symmetric and a lot of divergences are asymmetric. So there exist divergences that are metrics. All metrics are divergences, but not all divergences are metrics, right? So for a metric mu, you have uh, mu xy equals yx, but for a divergence d, uh, dxy is not necessarily equal to dyx. And so uh, depending on your manifold, you may actually need to adjust your notion of distance, right? So if you have an orthonormal coordinate system, right, you have a, a nice coordinate system, uh, you can just use Euclidean distance, right? And that's super easy and everybody knows it and it's wonderful. Uh, what's more common in information theory is we see the use of the KL divergence, right? So you have a distribution P and a distribution Q and you want to say, how close is P to Q? Uh, the KL divergence will tell you that, right? The kullback liebler divergence. Uh, and so we, we write it down here. It's that uh, integral on the right-hand side of that equation. And, right, KL divergence is not symmetric. So, you know, the KL divergence of P and Q, uh, yes, it is directly related to entropy. Uh, the KL divergence of P and Q, and I think I get to that a little bit more later, uh, but if I skip over it, I will uh, dig into that question. KL divergence of P and Q is not equal to the KL divergence of QP, right? And then the Bregman divergence is a uh, generalization of KL divergence. The Bregman divergence uh, takes a convex function uh, psi and uh, you get this really, really ugly um, representation which is generally useful on information manifolds where KL divergence uh, doesn't give us something uh, super useful uh, or where we're just kind of stuck with this convex function. Um, so now I'm gonna get into, that, that was all the mathematical prerequisites. So if you made it this far and you feel like you have even a vague notion of what I'm talking about, we should be golden for basically the entire rest of this talk. Um, so this is the first thing that uh, I saw in information geometry that kind of like made perfect sense and illustrated it to me really clearly, right? So we have this probability density function of a Gaussian random variable. And right, we have uh, P of X given mu and sigma, uh, where mu is the mean and sigma squared is the variance. Right is equal to this uh, you know, familiar equation. If if you've seen the Gaussian distribution, we know that right mu is the mean of our distribution and sigma squared is the variance. So if you have your standard normal distribution, then mu is zero and sigma squared is one, and you get this really nice formulation. Right, um, very cool. And this is a great example of like baby's first statistical manifold because you can think of each point, uh, right? Think of like a, a sheet of paper and in the middle you have zero, zero, right? Uh, and, and as you go up the sheet of paper, you increase uh, sigma. And as you go down, you decrease sigma. And as you go left, you decrease mu. And as you go right, you increase mu. And each point on that sheet of paper, on that right R2, is a Gaussian distribution because the coordinates are your parameters for the distribution. So that 
makes the set of all Gaussian distributions a statistical manifold, right? Which is so cool because this is your, you have an X, Y coordinate system on your manifold. So if you want to ask how far is my Gaussian distribution away from another Gaussian distribution, you can compute that metric, right? Which I think is really exciting. That, that was the first thing that made it clear to me, right? That, that there is this geometric notion. And so- Sorry, sorry Eric. Yeah, can no, I- go ahead. Okay, let, let me make sure I, I got, a, got what you meant here on the sticker manifold, correct? So when you said about this, so this manifold actually is like super large. Mm -hmm. It's actually you put lots of uh, Gaussian distribution together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you are saying that because you can identify the chart and atlas, yeah, through like for each distribution, you kind of map to their mu and sigma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like locally, you can then view it as like basically mapped to some R2. So mm -hmm. they are like local R2 structures. So it is like a manifold. Exactly. I see. Uh, okay. Yeah, so right, this, this X mu sigma, uh, you can use any X. And if you think of it, I say it's on that R2 system, but you know, really it has that third dimension and that third dimension is your, your argument to the function, right? Mm -hmm. Your input to the function. And so you have your, your X, Y plane and at any point on that X, Y plane, you can put in the thing that you're curious about, that X value, right? This, this X that is not fixed and say, uh, okay, right? What does it look like here? Where does it fall in this distribution? Um, or if you fix X, you can, you know, vary mu or sigma and kind of move it along uh, the set of distributions to see how that changes things. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so another uh, pretty simple statistical manifold is we let X be a discrete random variable that takes values between zero and N, right? And uh, you know, in this case, we'll say n is three. And so we have this uh, p sub i is the probability that x is equal to i, right? Where i is equal to zero, one, n, whatever, right? And so we can represent p of x, that same notion of p of x that would be our p of x parameterized by mu and sigma, uh, just by the vector uh, p0, p1 to pn, Right, so you have uh, these points in this simplex. You have this uh, P three, so P A, right, for example, falls uh, at a certain point. P B falls at a certain point for these different uh, points in the manifold. But everywhere there is some probability that it is one, two, three, and you can just parameterize that by a simple vector, right? So now you have a, a really neat vector representation to say what the probability of any given thing is. Um, this probability simplex is uh, super, super useful in game theory. And you actually see it come up a lot uh, in geometric formulations of game theory because it's a lot easier to deal with a vector than it is to deal with uh, multiple probability distributions, right? So there are loads of applications for information theory. Um, and again, most of which I don't know about. People have asserted that you can use it for physics and biology and finance, and I believe them. Uh, but game theory and statistical learning are the two that I'm most familiar with. And so I'm going to stick to those, right? <clears throat> so Statistical learning uh, is is probably the most probably the most well studied application for information geometry. Um, it's been used in computer vision. It's been used in general statistical learning, and a lot of that is because statistical learning depends upon maximum likelihood estimation for a lot of it. Right, what you're trying to do is find a parameter that. Uh, is, is most likely given the data that you've observed, right? So we've seen some data, we've observed something, we can estimate 
a distribution, and we want to find the set of parameters that best estimates our distribution. Um, and of course, we don't know the real distribution or we wouldn't have to do this. So we have to use a parameterized model, right? And in general, we call that parameter theta. So we have this uh, family of probability densities, right? And when I say indexed, that just means that, you know, one is number one, there's a number two, a number three, we have N probability densities, right? And so if we want to find an estimator for our parameter theta, uh, this is a function from uh, Xn onto theta, big theta, right? Th big theta being all of the possible parameters theta. So in the case of our Gaussian distribution, theta would be, uh, you know, some mu and some sigma, and big theta would be all of the possible mu's and sigmas, right? Uh, for our probability simplex, theta would just be n, and then, uh, you know, big theta would just be, I guess, uh, that would be the ring of integers, right? So our estimator, we want to approximate the parameter, right? So our estimator is, is uh, t. And so the error of the estimator is t minus theta, right? It's our estimation versus our best parameter. And so, right, we try and minimize the expected value uh, of the error of the estimator relative to the best parameter. Uh, yeah, and uh, I will get to that question momentarily. And so we define this score, right, um, as the, you know, uh, partial derivative with respect to theta of the natural log of f, uh, where f is that family of distributions uh, given x and it, it should be x. I wrote chi instead of using uh, the script mathsker. Uh, because I am lazy and my fonts weren't loading. So that is a good catch. Um, must n be finite or countable? So yes, uh, in this case, yes, n, n should be finite. I think it would be difficult. Uh, you could hypothetically have an infinite sample but then you wouldn't really want an estimator um, because then you could just know and you could just use like the law of large numbers and just use, uh, you just use like infinitude to make your life easier, right? If you had an infinite amount of data, uh, you wouldn't really need to estimate. You could just compute exactly. Uh, or more importantly, you wouldn't need to estimate because you already have infinite data. So you would just be able to look it up and that would be a lot easier than creating an estimator. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so we have, our, we have our score and we're gonna go back to our score here. And this is where things get uh, exciting, uh, right? So our Fisher information, and this is where we, we tie it into information theory, right? Um, so our Fisher information is, right, the amount of information uh, that a random variable has about some parameter, right? And we define this Fisher information, I don't know why I put I, because this should be J, uh, as the variance of our score, right? So our score is that partial derivative with respect to theta, of uh, log f and right, we just take that variance and that gives us our Fisher information. And our Fisher information is a matrix, um, which ends up being useful uh, very shortly. And one, one really uh, important thing is we have this idea of the kramer rao bound, right? So this is a, lower bound on the variance of our uh, of our estimator, right? So we have our estimator T. T is what we're trying to optimize to find the best possible parameter for 
uh, our function, uh, yeah, expectation is taken over X. Um, expectation is taken over X, no, is it? Is expectation taken over X? Yeah, it should be taken over X uh, because you're, you're, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is, I'm 100% sure, yeah. That's a good catch. Um, expectation is taken over X because we need the variance with respect to X so that we can uh, say how well theta models X, right? If the variance is very small, then uh, we know that it's a good estimator, right? Um, so this kramer rau bound gives us a, a lower bound on uh, the variance of the estimator, right? So this is how good can your estimator possibly be, right? If your estimator has very, very, very low uh, variance, then you would say it's a, a very robust estimator, right? It's very good. Um, and that's equal to the inverse of the Fisher information. So that is uh, really useful, right? If we compute this Fisher information, then we can know how good our estimator can be, right? Uh, so then if we have, right, our, our true distribution, and I don't know why I switched this to W, I need to write slides in one sitting and proofread them. Um, we let Q be our true distribution, uh, and P, which should be parameterized by theta, but I switched it to W because I was thinking about machine learning, uh, is our statistical model, right, that's now parameterized by W. Uh, and we let this uh, phi of X be in a, right, a prior probability density function, which we tend to, you know, just choose one. Uh, based on either our best knowledge, this is really just standard Bayesian uh, estimation, right? You pick a prior, um, there's uninformative priors, there's a, a bunch of different things that you can choose there. Then we compute our log likelihood uh, by this function here, right? Which is uh, the sum of, you know, sum from uh, one to n of log p x sub i given our parameter uh, minus a sub n log, uh, you know, phi given our parameter, right? Um, and that should still be x and not w. Um, that's my bad. This slide is terrible. Uh, I'll fix them and disseminate them to anybody who wants them. Uh, I, I did too much work on the var phi joke, and that's why this slide is awful. Um, right, where, where a sub n is a sequence of non-negative real values. Uh, so if we want to optimize our parameter, we want to optimize our parameterization, then we want to minimize uh, the log likelihood, right? And, and we do have a problem with this, which is that sometimes our model can be singular, uh, singular in a geometric sense. So a model is regular if our Fisher information is positive definite for all possible theta, right? If, if our Fisher information is always positive definite, uh, then we have a regular model. If it's not regular, it is singular. Um, so, Right, this, this can be tricky because it makes it really hard to compute the Fisher information. Uh, when we have singular models, it makes us hard to do uh, compute inverses. If we have uh, singular models, it makes us hard for us to compute, uh, you know, gradients. If we have singular models, it's singular models are annoying. And what's oh, really can, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Can you give some intuition on? not being singular is a problem. Is that because like in the criminal low, low, lower bound, you kind of take the inverse. Mm -hmm. So if it is not positive, definitely you cannot, like if it is singular, then basically you cannot take inverse. Or if you take inverse, something goes to infinity. 
and that's where the problem yeah so um when we think of like a, a singular model it's the way i like to think of it intuitively is that it means that there are some points where we can't tell them apart right there are certain points that we just can't tell apart right um and the reason i like to think of this is because of actually how we uh how, how we solve the problem of singularity uh but it it is because the uh positive definiteness of that fisher information is important for computing all of the other relevant features um about our model right so yeah that it, that having to invert it um becomes a problem and the uh what am i thinking of it, right we so it's because we're trying to do a uh, convex optimization right and we're trying to do convex optimization with respect to the fisher information uh so when it is not positive definite we can't compute the hessian uh right it, it's uh it just becomes a, a nasty mess and so we have to maintain positive definiteness in order to make things useful and also yeah thanks for the reply and also just one quick question about how to think about all this stuff connected to like statistical metaphors so should i always think of that okay so here you fix your big theta. Basically, it is corresponding to like a statistical manifold. For example, it is like Gaussian is the, the Gaussian one. Mm -hmm. And basically, then we want to study the geometry of it, etc. Mm -hmm. And then here it's like, oh, maybe this official information matrix captures something about it. And later on, that's my guess. Maybe you are also going to talk about some divergence and help us study this manifold. Yes. I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I, I totally just blanked on when uh, explaining the importance of positive definiteness is there are a lot of things that we want to do with uh, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the Fisher information matrix. And if it's not positive definite, then those eigenvalues can be negative and that can mess up uh, right some of the calculations that we want to do. So. One really cool thing is that uh, Watanabe found that we actually only need to find a change of variables that makes the KL divergence uh, monomial on the manifold, right? Uh, so that lets us uh, resolve all of these singularities. So Hironaka proved a bunch of stuff in algebraic geometry that I'm not even really sure I understand. <laughs> um, but it follows from this work by Hironaka that we can always find a change of variables uh, that lets us turn our KL divergence into uh, right a, a polynomial in one term, right? Uh, and so this gives us this fundamental theorem of singular learning, which is given by uh, Watanabe, which is that given mild conditions on this model, there always exists a change of variables, uh, right, from the manifold onto another, such that uh, the KL divergence is uh, equal to this, you know, mu to the two kappa uh, minus one over, you know, radical n, uh, et cetera. He gives a, a wonderful exposition in his book, which uh, you can find pretty easily on the internet. It is Algebraic Geometry and Statistical Learning Theory by Sumio Watanabe. Um, it's, it's really, really fascinating. Um, and essentially, this, uh, this Xi uh, of mu converges to a Gaussian process on the manifold which is very, very nice. Um, and so this lets us get back to our KL divergence, right? Uh, so, 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 you know, over again. Yeah, yeah. Have, uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. So first, uh, I thought KL divergence will have two, two arguments. So 
because you are measuring the divergence between two probability distributions. Mm -hmm. But here only row. Right. Row so this this row is actually the change of variables. So, so you only have two, two distributions. Oh. Yeah. So that that mu is is a little bit overloaded, and let me. Um, so this is two row three. Let me make sure I've got the formulation correct because I pulled it out of the book mm -hmm. yesterday. Um, yeah, so this is giving um, this is giving row of mu mapping onto omega um, as the parameter space. So this would be the parameterized distribution. So this is just accounting for uh, multiple parameters, right? This is talking about the manifold that our parameterized distributions live on. So there are there are two arguments. This is just uh, reframing those. And let me swap this over because I think this captures it nicely. Um, so, so how should I think about the, the two distributions you put in the KL divergence? There we go. Uh, nope, this one. So this KL divergence, right? So this is, right, mapping, this row of mu gives us this omega, and this gives us this. Oh, I see. So you, yeah. you kind of fix the true distribution here. Yes, you fix the distributions, oh. and then this, yeah. I think that this representation actually captures it a lot better than the mm, one okay, uh, I see. that Watanabe wrote down. And mm. these are just some random slides that I found in like two seconds. I see. Uh, yes. Yeah. Makes sense. I see. And the second question is then why, yeah, I, I don't have too much background here. So I don't really understand why you say it, it converged to Gaussian process corresponding to the resolution of a singularity. Yeah. yeah. How to see that? Yeah, why this uh, yeah, why, yeah, why, this why you, one can interpret this theory as the resolution of a singularity? Yeah. So I I do not know why C converges to a Gaussian process. Uh, right. That is that is covered in the proof of the fundamental theorem of singular learning. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I guess my question is not about like why, how to prove this. I'm mm -hmm. saying like why one can interpret this theory as a like a resolution of a singularity, or maybe I I I I I confused. I was confused. No, I th I I so I think I understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. um, and it's. If we right, we change these variables. We we map this uh, row of mu onto omega. Mm -hmm. uh, why does a Gaussian process pop out of that? Mm -hmm. uh, and that I don't have a good answer to. Um, that is something I should probably learn. Um, but it's not something I have a uh, a great answer to at the moment. Okay. Um, but I can I can look that up and I can figure it out. Um, yeah. If it is yeah. not so crucial related to future next few slides, then yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's, it's not crucial. Uh, it's not crucial. This is just uh, interesting and useful because sometimes we do run into. I think the, the takeaway here is that sometimes we run into singular models and there exists a map that lets us resolve those singularities, right? So we can blow up uh, the uh, singularity 
and then we can get back to computing uh, KL divergence, right? We can get back to figuring out our information and how far away our distributions are from one another, even if we run into uh, a singularity. And so I think that that is, um, I think that is really the key here. Um, and that is, it, the resolution of singularities is very, very, very complicated. Uh, I think that that theorem alone won Hironaka the Fields Medal. Um, and it involves a lot of machinery from algebraic geometry that I'm not intimately familiar with. Uh, but the key is that there exists a, a way that we can blow up these singular uh, regions so that we can get back to having something that we can compute KL divergence on. And so uh, I'm going to completely change gears again now that we know, uh, you know, we kind of have that information, right? And I, I want to do an extremely quick background because we're actually coming up on time on neural networks. Right, so uh, neural networks have gotten a lot of press. I'm sure that I'm not uh, telling anybody anything new. And so we have uh, each individual neuron has an affine transformation, which is just your weights times your input uh, plus a bias term. And then we have a nonlinearity, right? And the two most common nonlinearities, so-called activation functions, are ReLU, uh, the rectified linear unit which is just this maximum of zero and your affine uh, transform and the sigmoid activation function, right? And the ReLU activation function is, is probably the most popular activation function in use today uh, for hidden layers because it's very efficient to compute. And so, right, this is kind of a, a toy neural network. This is your simplest neural network where the yellow on the far left is your input, your red on the far right is an output neuron, uh, and then these two layers in the middle are your hidden neurons. Uh, this is a densely connected multi-layer perceptron. It's, it's kind of the simplest architecture. But you can see that at each stage here, right, you have your input that goes to those four blue hidden neurons, uh, all of the inputs go to the, the four hidden blue neurons. And then that uh, Wx plus b is computed. And then, right, assuming it's a ReLU activation, you take the maximum of that. So if it's if Wx plus b is larger than uh, zero, you pass that on to the next neuron, those green neurons, and you do the same thing. And then that goes to your output neuron where usually a softmax or sigmoid activation function is used to get your output, right? Which is some class or is either a positive negative value uh, probability, right? And uh, so this is kind of a, a 30 second crash course on how neural networks work in general. Uh, completely skipping over transformers, recurrent neural networks, convolutional neural nets, and, and all of the other things. Uh, this is sort of the simplest architecture we can think of, right? And neural networks uh, end up having this really cool geometry, right? So there is a branch of algebraic geometry called tropical geometry, and we can study geometric structures over the max plus semi-ring, right? Uh, and there was a recent paper called Neural Bellman Ford Networks that probably should have talked about this, and I'm not sure if the authors know about it, uh, but they have some restrictions to a semi-ring, uh, and this is the semi-ring they should be thinking about, because in, in the semi-ring, addition is defined as the max operation, which you'll note is the same as the ReLU operation with one operand set to zero. Uh, and multiplication is defined as conventional addition. And as we covered in uh, one of the first lectures this week, right, uh, when we were talking about reductions, regular multiplication is reducible to addition, right? So you can actually mimic that Wx plus b uh, with tropical multiplication, right? And so these, these ReLU networks have really deep connections to tropical geometry. Um, and there's this interesting result from Zhang et al., uh, which shows that all feedforward ReLU networks 
are equivalent to tropical rational maps, right? So a rational map, rational being like the rational numbers, a fraction, map being like a function, right? Um, so tropical, right? They are rational maps over the tropical semi-ring. Uh, so they are a polynomial tropically divided by another polynomial, um, which is cool. That's unbelievably cool that we have this beautiful geometric representation of uh, feedforward ReLU networks. Um, really exciting. I keep coming back to this. I'm sure it's important. I just don't know how yet. Um, but if anybody's interested in deep learning theory, like this feels like a fruitful avenue for exploration. And some really good work has been done by uh, a group of researchers at U Chicago on this. Uh, it's very, very cool stuff. And Bern Sturmfels at uh, Berkeley also does a lot of work on tropical semi-rings. Uh, just a quick question. Yeah. So since the definition you gave here is quite algebraic, so how should I think of it uh, as a geometric object? Or I think of the corresponding, uh, like yeah. uh, the ring, like the point. So point. the way that I think of the tropical semi-ring is actually as kind of a lattice, right? So you have like your zero plus zero and then, or, or zero times zero, right? You have your zero point. And then you can do tropical multiplication to add to one, two, three, right? And then as you take the max operator, your tropical addition, you kind of create these lattice-like structures. Um, that's, that's how I think about it geometrically, is as a lattice. Uh, where you take your, you know, or I'm sorry, I, I got it totally back. Yeah, no, I got it right, right? Your, your zero plus zero, right? You have that straight line down at the bottom. And then as you add, you kind of move up, right? Uh, so as you, as you, or as you multiply, you move up. Uh, I keep screwing myself up because in this case, multiplication is addition, uh, right? So you, you jump up to one when you multiply uh, zero by one. And then, uh, right, you jump up to two when you multiply one by one. Uh, and as you add, you stay on that flat plane. And so you develop this very natural lattice structure. Uh, and that's, that's how I tend to think about it geometrically. So when we think about these, uh, right, these tropical rational maps, you can think of them as like, subsets of this lattice where you have you know your your uh, operands up there and they just take this section of the lattice that maps together <clears throat> and you can have you know your top your your numerator and your denominator and then the middle portion of the lattice gives you uh, that rational map and that gets you from your input to your output based on uh, you know, the construction of that. And you can actually, uh, since you have a variable still in play, right? You have your input variables. Uh, you can actually represent that as like a, an arithmetic circuit uh, where, each, <coughs> where each part of that becomes uh, a branch in your arithmetic circuit tree. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to blaze through this part, uh, right? This just defines a neuromanifold. A neuromanifold is when we talk about the manifold associated with a neural network, not in the tropical sense, in the uh, general sense, right? You have your parameter space, which um, if you've ever trained a neural network, you know that your uh, theta can actually be uh, since it's all the network's weights and biases, it can be very, 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 very large. It can actually be billions uh, <clears throat> of parameters, which means that you are going to have uh, billions of dimensions on your manifold. Uh, not great, not, not super great. Um, but the statistical manifold associated with any particular neural network is the set of all of these uh, 
probability distributions parameterized by theta. <clears throat> and the metric defined on our manifold is the Fisher information. So that's what tells us the distance, right? And because the Fisher information is exactly the negative Hessian of log likelihood, right? Log likelihood being the thing that we want, right? We want to minimize log likelihood. Um, <clears throat> we can actually use the Fisher information for gradient descent. The Fisher information tells us what the path of steepest descent is on this manifold. Uh, and this gives us natural gradient descent, right? Natural gradient descent uh, has been explored uh, pretty substantially. And this lets us optimize our loss with respect to the inputs and outputs using just the Fisher information for our parameter, right? The difficulty is that computing this matrix and inverting this matrix uh, can be pretty tough for large networks because it has so many parameters, right? Um, Approximation approaches do exist, uh, which is really nice for online learning because stochastic gradient descent isn't great uh, when we're talking about doing online learning for neural nets. So there may actually be some benefit to using the natural gradient for online learning. Um, and using this approximation gives us a lot of the benefits of second order optimization uh, without having to commute compute the Hessian. And computing the Hessian is, is hard, right? Hard from a computational standpoint. Um, <clears throat> this is my second to last slide, so I'm really excited to present this one. Um, this is one of my favorite, uh, actually, geometric restatements of an existing theorem. So Nash's theorem, right, the proof that uh, Nash equilibrium always exists in uh, every finite game. We can prove that geometrically by taking the uh, M1 dimensional simplex of mixed strategies, right? So it's normalized zero to one. Uh, and we take this, uh, right? Sigma sub i is equal to the uh, P sub i, that's your probability in <clears throat> positive r to the mi dimensions, right? Uh, and that's defined where, right, the sum of all the PIs uh, need to equal one in, in all your dimensions. So if you take each element of the probability vector, uh, the sum of each element in that vector has to sum to one, right? Because probability can't be bigger than one. So we take this function uh, rho sub i, which is the map of um, sigma negative i being sigma without i, right? So without uh, element i onto sigma i. So if this rho sub i is single valued, then it's a graph in uh, sigma without i with values in sigma i, right? Which means that it's also a graph over sigma i with values in sigma not i. Uh, and these two graphs have to intersect somewhere, right? Because they are, they are pointing uh, in this uh, m dimensional space. They have to have some point where they intersect, right? Um, and that point is the Nash equilibrium. So basically, by thinking about uh, your probability simplex and the vectors that point to different strategies in your probability simplex, you find that if you map that out as a graph, there, is, there always exists a point where the two graphs have to intersect. Uh, there's just no way that they don't, right? One is going off this way, one is going off that way, there must be some point uh, because they are not parallel, right? Uh, we know that they're not parallel. They must intersect. The point at which they intersect is the Nash equilibrium. And uh, this comes from Jurgen Jost. Uh, there's a, a book on applications of information geometry. Uh, and this is 
you know, just a, a really nice demonstration, I think, that you can take a problem that is, is fairly difficult to show, uh, right? In Nash's theorem, he uses Kakutani's fixed point theorem uh, to prove that as you, you know, take, take any map and you stretch it out and you compress it, no matter what, there's always a point that must stay fixed. Um, this geometric restatement basically says, if you take it and put it in a probability simplex, uh, the lines have to cross somewhere, right? And uh, yeah, I love that. That was very exciting to me. Um, and then these are just references. And with that, I am two minutes over time and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I really appreciate everybody uh, hanging out and watching my poorly constructed slides. Yeah, maybe let's first thank uh, Eric. Yeah, yes.